Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Ford, featuring Wi Fi connectivity with available sync and My Ford Touch. Now your car can be a Wi Fi hotspot. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30 day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. You were like your Dracula frame rate. <laughs> I get that a lot. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 51. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was a guy with a Tesla coil built into his hat, and the Tesla coil was playing music, and it was playing Mortal Kombat, the old techno song from the mid-90s. So wait, Tesla coil, Mortal Kombat, and hackery. Yes. Three uh, great viral things. Viral video that, gold. Yeah, That's the exactly. formula. If you, if you can have those three things, then you're totally good. You know what else is viral video gold? Scott Johnson. That's right. What? Of frogpants.com. Welcome to the show, Scott Johnson. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. You know what? I love frame rate. Why has it taken so damn long for this triumvirate of brilliance to happen, to actually take place? What's going on? We We've been actively avoiding you, is the short oh, answer. I wasn't, I wasn't going to admit to that, Brian, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were working up to this point, Scott. I, when we sat down to recreate frame rate back in 1975, uh, Brian and I said, you know what our goal should be? Our goal should be to get this show good enough that we can comfortably have Scott Johnson on and not feel inferior. Ah, okay. That uh, that sounds better to me than that you were actively avoiding me. But I will take both, and I'm thrilled to be here in your presence and in the presence of Brian Brushwood. Actually, you know, we get uh, we, we we get the brand of cord cutting. We're the cord cutting show. We're on the edge of like, okay, watch your video on the internet. Uh, but we are often criticized because Brian and I both still haven't totally made the jump sort of, we we're we, sort of like we've got we've got our bungee uh well actually this is a bad metaphor because then we would be corded but we got our our bungee jumping gear on and the guy's promising us it will be fine we're like i don't know but you fall so fast and and what about the the kids need the cable because they can watch their disney xd and then finally we need somebody to just be like one two three go and just push us off we're like oh yeah. thank you so we want to have guests that are the equivalent in this metaphor of people bouncing up from the, the creek bottom laughing uh, back towards us going it's great <laughs> down here and that's why we have scott johnson on because you cut the cord i think uh 1968 right yeah it's been a good <laughs> it's been a good 40 plus years uh since i cut the cord uh you no cut actually, the cord about, before the records <laughs> right i am i'm actually three years into this cord cutting experiment and i'll tell you you know brushwood you are not totally wrong with your metaphor it did feel a bit like i was being prodded to jump but I wasn't sure that looked like a long way down. There was no coming back, or at least, you know, your pride wouldn't let you come back in this case. And right. I made the jump. We dumped it. We save 800 bucks a year. I get everything I want. I miss the live sports, but I can get a lot of cool HD stuff over the air. So that's not really a problem so much when the big games come on. Uh, besides that, besides live programming like sports, we have not looked back at all. And in the kids department, you can get anything you want for kids on Netflix, Hulu, and all these other sources. It's all there. There's tons of it. There's maybe too much of it. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily want your kid to sit down and watch 9,000 episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants in a row. 
Right. Uh, so, so we even have to control that a little bit and say, all right, mix it up and watch Ren and Stimpy once in a while or something. And, then, and so, old, you know, it's all there. Kid? How old were so, your kid when you started the experiment? Because that's the biggest thing for me is like, finally, Penelope's, what, seven, about to turn eight. Uh, Josie just turned four. So now they're at the point where they can start to handle their own programming. The main thing I don't want to do is be called into the room every five minutes to set up another video for them. Well, the the big switch, for, or I should say the big improvement for us was when we got a Roku. And I'm not, they're not sponsoring the show, but I'll say this. The Roku's simple, to e a simple easy to use remote made a huge difference. That being said, my kids, when we cut the cord, were, let's see, Nick's 11 now. So he would have been, let's do the math here. It would have been like eight. Eight, yeah, yeah. eight uh, years. I would have had, my, my other daughter would have been maybe 11. Uh, and my other daughter would have been 14, 13, 14. So we've been doing it since then. And that's the thing. You want to be able to gauge what your little kids think, but also what your teenagers think. And surprisingly, nobody has complained, not even once. Um, we've got multiple TVs with multiple Roku set up, running multiple bits of content. We've got an Apple TV on one of them also, PS3 here, 360 there, lots of little boxes feeding in different, different content. And nobody's, nobody's once complained about it. The only well, complaint I have what. is when I have to wait for something I'm really into. Like, I don't and, really want to wait till next day for Walking Dead, for example. That kind of well, stuff. Well, yeah, and, that's, and that, that would be a problem for me because I really do enjoy the night of experience. Although half the time I end up watching it DVR'd anyway. But that's one of those things like $800 a year. You could buy a lot of Rokus, a lot of Apple TVs, and you could pay a lot of 2 to $3 per episodes of stuff you care about and, and not get close to spending what you're spending on cable right now. Yeah, the issue is, am I okay with time shifting in the way that's even more time shifted than a DVR? So am I okay with next day on most of the shows I give a crap about? And the answer is most of the time, yes, it's not that big of a deal to wait uh, to see what I want to do. And in fact, it's kind of nice sometimes to just compile five or six episodes so I can take a Saturday and really, you know, dig in and watch it all. So I'm, it's true time shifting and I don't, I don't really have to be beholden to any schedule and it's worked really well for us. So I have zero regrets. I have $800 more to spend on the actual content that I want instead of a bunch of junk I'm never going to watch. Um, I'm only irritated that I didn't make the jump sooner. Now, that being said, my options were a lot less sooner than that. Like six years ago, forget it. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a great way to consume a lot of good content and truly cut the cord. But nowadays, man, there's no reason not to, in my opinion. See, yeah. I, I've always approached it as if you want to have access to the widest variety of stuff immediately the moment it's available you're going to talk yourself out of cord cutting because you're going to say yeah but i'm going to have to wait a day for the walking dead or yeah but i won't be able to get that broadcast on the mlb network of the arizona fall league all-star game so there's not you know that you can come up with a million reasons which is what Eileen and I do. I mean, we've gotten this close a couple times to being like, should we do this? Really? Should we do this? But there's always something that we're like, yeah, but we don't want to live without it. And I think if we just did it, like if we were forced into it, like the DirecTV box exploded and, you know, we just were like, forget it, we're canceling. I think we would live fine because you, your expectations of what you're going to get will change based on what's available to you. I know this because I lived without television for a long time in the 90s. I definitely didn't have cable television. I didn't even watch over-the-air television for a long time. And so I just entertained myself in different ways. I think a lot of people are doing that now. And I think if I, you know, if I was just like, you know what, forget it. So what if I can't watch this or that right away, I'll be able to watch it eventually. Uh, and right. I just, I'll just change my expectation of when I'm going to see it. Stuff becomes new for me at a different time. It's so interesting, there, there, too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. By all means, go ahead. I was, gonna, I was just going to say this. There is a, there's a piece of this that I think people forget about. And I don't want to get too philosophical about it because, honestly, would I be as excited about cutting the cord if everybody was cutting the cord and then everybody was having to pay higher Internet prices, more ISPs were, were in, uh, put, you know, instituting caps, this sort of stuff. We could go on for days about that whole side of it. But I do want to say there is one other benefit that we really liked about this, and that is the act of discovery is greater with my move than it was when we had regular, you know, television or cable or satellite. And that is that we are finding things that are bargain basement moves to Netflix or to Hulu or somewhere else that nobody really heard of or nobody gave a chance or got canceled for some reason. I'll give you an example. Better Off Ted was a show that was on for two seasons, two measly seasons. And that show is freaking fantastic. I think it is the true spiritual successor to uh, Arrested Development, as an example, of wow. that kind of comedy. It is fan-freaking-tastic and really, really funny. I don't think we would have ever seen it, heard about it, or watched it because it was really lousy in terms of it getting promoted by the network and when it was on. 
Um, but we found it on Netflix, and we watched that that series, those two seasons, fairly regularly over again and over again, a bit like you can do with, with Arrested Development. It is a hilarious show. I miss it terribly, but there it is. I found it. I wouldn't have found it any other way. My wife has countless things that she's found via Netflix or other services. Netflix probably the biggest culprit here because they bring a lot of uh, stuff that's either uh, dead or you haven't heard about or or even shows that are still on the air like um, uh, Parenthood, which is turns out to be kind of fantastic. I didn't expect that, but I don't think we would have been interested in it otherwise. It showed up a couple seasons on Netflix. We're like, eh, let's give it a try. We're totally hooked. We're ripping through the whole thing. No commercials, all good. Got the bandwidth, why not? And it's, you know, it's served us well for three years. Well, okay, so there are two things that I think are conspiring to make me possibly want to make like a New Year's challenge here at Frame Ray. Maybe we'll both jump off the cliff just, just for one month at first. Now, I, I will say that I've kind of been ready for this for a long time and that I've never signed a contract with Time Warner because I wanted to be able to walk away at any given time. So I'm sure I'm overpaying for some of my services. But uh, right now they have a $99 wideband internet special, which is the highest level of internet that you can get. It's not a lot better than what you get right now, but it's enough that I think it's uh, maybe five megabit upstream or something like that, that I kind of want to do it, but it's a big Wide jump from $40 bands. up to 99. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is I'm already this close to wanting to cancel our home phone service. And if I cancel phone and uh, cable, all of a sudden that's $100 I'm taking out of the budget where I could afford to go to the highest level of, of bandwidth. I don't know. I'm I'm going to suggest that maybe we should have a frame rate challenge. Maybe we'll see who will sign up. Drop us an email at frameratereshow at gmail .com and say that come January first, we'll we'll try to quit cold turkey and see what happens. Uh, would Is Bonnie Would Bonnie go along with that? I don't know yet. That's see, why I, <laughs> my, my only hesitation, if I were if I were making this decision alone, I'd 100% be like, let's do it. Let's try it. Uh, but the thing that has always kept me from cutting the cord when I've gotten close is Eileen saying, eh, I don't want to do it because of this or that. Uh, there, there are things that I want to do, too. She's saying she's over there going, no way. You're not, <laughs> you're not doing it. So there's your answer. Now, keep in mind also, cutting the cord doesn't mean that you give up all of your real-time entertainment. For, for example, right, I do over the to air. be there for the end of Lost. Lost was a cultural phenomenon, and it came to a close. But if I had an over-the-air HD receiver and a TiVo box with a lifetime subscription... What about HBO? Uh, Scott, what uh, do you do for True Bloods or uh, Entourages? Uh, do you just not watch well, that stuff? Or? For, for True Blood, I avoid it like the plague, and if Eileen's still listening, Sookie. Um, but no, I, the, I avoid that show because I don't really like it that much. But let's say Game of Thrones, Tom. Well, yeah, okay, Game they, of Thrones. Now, now, do the episodes come out on iTunes like the next day? Nope. Like, what about like Boardwalk Empire? How no, can you see that they, right now? They do not have a deal with anybody like that. HBO yet, puts no. their episodes on iTunes out the next season. Correct. So, in this particular case, this is now here is the underbelly of the beast. I had to go to a brother in law's house to see these episodes. So I, I had to go to somebody who has regular cable and a subscription to HBO in order for me to see episodes of Game of Thrones. And I hated every second of that. I'm mad, but I'm mad at HBO because there are a growing number of people like me who would buy their content every single day there was an episode out. I would gladly pay whatever it is per episode or make me do a subscription or something. Hell, hell let, me do, let me have the HBO Go app on my iPad and let me pay for that outside of subscription to HBO proper. I would do that also. Yeah, it makes um, but me they're wonder, just not like, giving people options. So I know what the legal distinction is, but what is the ethical distinction for something like, let's say you've got a buddy who never watches, he's got cable, but he never really watches it. What if you said, look, here, I'll give you, here's a hundred bucks. This should pay for a year of HBO. Uh, sign up for HBO. I don't care if you watch it or not. Just give me your login info so I can watch HBO Go. In that case, like HBO gets all the cash for it. Uh, and they get all their tracking for it because they show that that it's watched. It's just that you don't sign up for all of cable. Is that is that unethical? What do you think? Mm. It's uh, violating their terms of service. Honestly, yeah. I don't know that HBO is going to mind all that much. Who's going to mind are the cable companies because DirecTV, Comcast, Time Warner, they're all going to say, oh, no. We were getting that guy's money anyway, and one of the reasons we provide HBO is to entice you to sign up and pay the $40 a month for the basic service, and those are the people who you are taking money away from in that situation. Yeah, but that's a jerk thing for them to do to begin with. So if you're a <laughs> What, to charge for their service? No, 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 no. To, to intentionally have, uh, have the sweet treat over this $40 gulf that they're going to make you jump over, knowing that all you want is that $10 sweet treat at the end. That's um, business, man. 
Uh, yes. Okay. And you know what else is business is uh, when you have a supply and demand that, that you, the market reacts to certain inelasticities. And if HBO is mm. going to be inelastic, then the market's going to respond. That's all I'm going to say. It's obvious why they do it, though. I mean, they've got a service they want you to subscribe to specifically, and that's how they that's how all their, their revenue is generated. They don't do it through ads or anything else, and they do it through DVD sales. So they've kind of got this back-end thing so, uh, solved, and they've got the front-end thing solved. I know why they don't want to give me $1.99 episodes on iTunes of Game of Thrones because all that does is make me go, oh, well, I don't have to subscribe to HBO now. I can pay just this little amount of money for the two shows I care about. Maybe I want Boardwalk. Maybe I want that, but that's it. I, I would really like them to do that, and I'm really anxious to see what this rumor deal with Netflix is between HBO and Netflix, but I, I don't see them changing the way they do things uh, too quickly, and it's really irritating because they're making really awesome original content, and their model works for them. They make a bunch of money, and they don't need the kind of viewership a network does to survive, so... I, I understand where they're at. I understand why it's in direct opposition of where I'm at. But I think that they're going to be forced to be more, like you say, Brian, more elastic and start allowing people to consume their content in ways that aren't necessarily the straight HBO path through cable or through satellite. Well, with any luck, nobody from Time Warner is listening. And hopefully for the rest of this episode, we won't have to discuss the Warner Group at all when we talk about the big story. This just in, the big story. In a Monday court filing, Warner Brothers admitted that it has issued takedown notices for files without looking at them first. Oh, wait. So we are going to talk about Warner yeah, Brothers. Yeah, real briefly, Hot File is in a legal battle with Warner Brothers over uh, linking uh, and hosting. Uh, they, they're sort of a mega upload type place where users upload files. They say it's it's safe harbor, and they will take down stuff. Warner Brothers is accusing them of, of, of inducement, uh, of of not respecting the DMCA. But one of the things Hot File accusing them of, and Time Warner admitted to, was that Hot File was receiving takedown notices for files that didn't belong to Warner Brothers, and in some cases for files that were not infringing at all. In fact, the best case uh, was that there was a submission done by an algorithm. That's, why, that's how Warner Brother was doing this for the contacts page on Hot Files saying it was infringing. Uh, so, you know, contacts.html, the page that says, here's how to get a hold of us. Yeah, that was I, submitted as Warner Brothers. This is infringing our content. Uh, and the studio said that it did not download every file it believed to be infringing prior to submitting the file's URL to the Hot File takedown tool because the, given the volume and pace of new infringements on Hot File, Warner could not practically download and view the contents of each file prior to requesting that it be taken down. Yeah, uh, and first of all, this is the weird part when you have algorithms making legal claims. And I understand that they're going to do it uh, to, to battle with the, the sheer volume out there. But meanwhile, is it reasonable to you guys that Warner sent one million notices to Hotfile over two years? This is just one service provider. Now, I, I don't know, honestly, how many of those were legitimate claims, but we do know that, that at least four of them, which sounds minuscule, were, were uh, rebutted. You know, they, they, they protested the, the claim saying that, the, that it wasn't valid. But I don't know how many people are just terrified of these big media companies when they send out the takedown notices. I'll, I know that, that, by and large, the smart decision when it came to uh, DMCA takedowns from the, uh, the RIAA was to settle because it was going to be a big pain in the butt. You couldn't possibly afford to tackle with their law lawyers. I will bet you the $50 bill in my wallet right now that... I really do have one. I don't know why. It just showed up in there today. I don't know who gave it to me. My wife slipped cash in my wallet. I can't figure it out. Anyway... Uh, here's what I, I truly believe. If this is, if that's how many they've sent out over this period of time, and if that's what's, you know, if they're, if they're erroneously pulling files or telling them to pull files that aren't really theirs or they don't really have any right to ask them to pull, uh, I think it's being, it's being run automatically by some sort of bot system or something of their own making. It's not a dude. Nobody's sitting around going, up. Oh, I see a copy of, uh, Looney Tunes Collection 4 there. That's, that would be ours, or, or messing up and saying, you've got Freddy versus Jason, and, and they're not the right studio to own those rights. I think that they're botting it. I think they're looking for keywords. I think they're looking for files that they are They were looking at file names. Actually, they admitted that much. They yeah. said, you know, we were yeah. just, in some cases, we were just scanning file names, and if it was, had the name, that's how they ended up with the contacts list, uh, is there was something in the title of that page that matched, I think, the box, uh, which was one of the Warner Brothers movies. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So if, so if they're seeing... 
keywords and they're also looking for maybe they're looking for metadata so files that are named something 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 dot zip really are dot avi files and they're trying to be hidden in some way or whatever they're trying to just go around all the little hackery ways we can hide what we have as files and they're just trying to get it at all sides so this doesn't shock me at all if this was a group of people or a department of people that were in charge of this that'd be one thing but these are robots doing their best and they're not smart enough that's all I think what's going on here is a lot of people reacting to this saying, yeah, Time Warner is, is, is just being awful and taking down things that aren't theirs and they should be stopped. There's, there's one thing going on with the court case, which is Hot Files accusing them of acting in bad faith and requesting things to be taken down that they knew were not theirs. Time Warner saying, we actually didn't know that they were not ours. It was not bad faith. And I think Time Warner is going to win on that. They're gonna, they're, the court's going to find that given the amount of infringing material and that they had to move through, that Time Warner was not acting in bad faith by using an algorithm that was not perfect. However, it does point out to me that the DMCA is broken because yeah. what happens is Time Warner in good faith following the policies of the DMCA felt that the only way they could protect their in their material from being infringed was to run an algorithm because there were millions of infringements. So they I mean they are with the back against the wall and therefore they had they were put in a place where they had to ask for some legal things to be taken down or they wouldn't have been able to effectively protect their own material. And the DMCA works in such a way that if something is requested to be taken down, it's presumed to be infringing until a counter notice is filed. And you can use it that way. Now, I don't think Time Warner was acting maliciously, but you could act maliciously. It's against the law, but it's hard to prove. Maybe if Time Warner was acting maliciously, they tune that algorithm just a little bit off so it takes down some more stuff, and then in court go, ah, it was the algorithm. You know, we weren't acting in bad faith. Hard to prove. The DMCA doesn't address the fundamental issue that we are dealing with an entirely new kind of technology that makes copies of everything in infinite amounts, and intellectual property law cannot deal with that. That's why we've got these crazy ideas of, like, people trying to make businesses selling used digital music, and then, then the industry gets it and comes in and goes, well, you can't sell used digital music because you're making copies of it to, to send it from one machine to another. All of a sudden, they get the fact that everything's copyable. The DMCA is trying to teach, treat stuff like it's actual physical objects. That's not going to work. We need an right. entirely fundamental rehabbing of the entire copyright law from the ground up to deal with the fact that, you know what, copying is like breathing now. Uh, and and you, it is way too easy to copy, and you're never going to stop people from doing it. So let's put into place something that actually encourages artistic creation, like actually demonstrably encourages it. Something that demonstrably and scientifically well, proven it, it, to encourage innovation instead of just trying to tack together all this crap that doesn't do anything to protect innovation. All it might do is possibly protect the bottom lines of some companies and ends up causing all kinds of untold, uh, ridiculous side effects. Well, and keep in mind that there is precedent for this kind of thing. You've got the innovations, for example, uh, when it comes to uh, you know, BMI ASCAP, uh, if you want to cover a song, there is an automatic royalty that you can pay. You just go out, you perform it, you do it, and you have to pay the automatic royalty. And it's a reasonable royalty, and it's built in. And if your show explodes, if your, if your cover explodes, that's great. Then a percentage of everything you gained out of that is going to go to the original artist. At least that's the way I understand it. I'm sure somebody will complain about it uh, on, on, the, on the email. But uh, why can't you have something akin to that, that kind of like what iTunes is doing with the music matching service, where essentially they found a backdoor way to take your giant library of pirated songs and figure out a way for $25 a year to get you to pay to access them anywhere you want and built into that is payment royalties to all of the individual artists who have never seen a cent from the piracy up until this moment. Why can't there be something like that? Some website that takes all of the BitTorrent traffic and then they make money on their ad revenues or however it is they'll, they'll make money on the vast popularity of being able to get anything you want and build in automatic royalties to it to the different uh, uh, companies who created or own the different medium. Great great idea. That, that, that is a good idea. It's worth looking at. It's worth testing. It's worth seeing if there's... You know, spins on that that will work, but that's what we need to do. We need to take ideas and, and several of them and say, okay, maybe these will actually work. I love that. But you know what? Until then, uh, we are going to deal with broken laws uh, that are doing a little bit to try to help piracy, while piracy, as, as we all know, is constantly eroding away at the industry, at the media industry, and that leads us to another big story.
Stop everything. It's another big story. Tomorrow, Congress uh, is going to have their first hearing in the Judiciary Committee about the Stop Online Piracy Act uh, that gives more, hand, more power into the hands of private companies to fight piracy. And that is needed uh, because Viacom's revenue in fiscal year Q4 uh, was up 46%. Oh, wait, uh, uh, I, that yeah. doesn't make sense. Uh, growth to the filmed entertainment segments, 46% quarterly revenue rise. Uh, Comedy <laughs> Central grew with an 8% gain. So because, because look at that, let's look. Okay, that might sound bad, but Viacom's growth of 46% should have been a growth of 75%. <laughs> well, <laughs> All right. No. Okay. Now, in all fairness, I've heard you you make this argument a number of times. And and first of all, I totally agree with you. It is outrageous in a period where content providers are seeing unprecedented growth and record profits that they should be crying and whining about how much more money they should make. But uh, consider the other side of the coin. Why? I mean, is there any defense for where they're coming from? Can you can you even begin to see their side of the coin? Yes, I can. Uh, I, I I can see it if. If a lot of other things were true and they were saying, look, yeah, our, we're doing OK, uh, we're, we're making good money. Uh, but our long term projections show that all of that money is going into the toilet because we are we're swimming upstream. Uh, and, and really, our revenue rise should have been going like this. Now it's going like this. And we think it's headed that way. Right. If that was a reasonably provable, objective assessment, then I could see their point. But what's happening is that's not why. They're asking this. They're saying we're losing jobs. Uh, we're we're losing millions of dollars to piracy. And in fact, they're not losing millions of dollars to piracy. Most of the studies that have been done have shown that piracy, if it does have any effect, has increased sales and revenue to media industries. So I, you know, I just I I see all this stuff come out saying. The, re the revenue is going up. They outperformed other other industries in, during the recession. Uh, they seem to be making good money. Most of the companies are are at least flat, if not up, in a time when a lot of companies are down. And I just I don't see any evidence that the so-called threat to the companies in any way justifies changing the laws to grant more power to the industry and take away our fair use rights. So, does, so is Viacom, does Viacom, the company then, are, are they spinning it this direction, Tom, in your opinion, because they're trying to drive legislation for greater protection? I mean, what, what the, what's the point of doing that? Why spin it that way then? Uh, yeah, the, the point of doing it is they, they want to have more power uh, to shut down copyright. Part of it's a little emotional because they, say, they just think it's wrong, and I understand that. Uh, when they're like, hey, we spent a lot of money on Transformers, and then we see it out on BitTorrent just being taken for free. That pisses us off, and we want to go after those guys and make them pay. But also yeah. part of it is them saying, you know what? We have a pretty safe position here, and we don't want to lose it. Uh, we don't want to lose it to other innovative companies, and one of the ways to protect it is to protect the rights so that we have them and everybody else doesn't. All right, well, so there's two questions I have for you. Number one is, uh, does do you think the fact that they are experiencing reasonable profits and, and things seem to be pretty robust in the industry, does that weaken their argument that they need greater anti-piracy protection and therefore increase the likelihood that we will not see big changes or draconian laws in, instituted? Or does the fact that they are making money hand over fist allow them to spend that much more on lobbyists, which means that you think that it is more likely that we'll see a draconian laws yeah, I, th I think both of those are true. I think it weakens their argument, but I think they have enough money uh, that they can they can spend on influencing uh, legislation uh, that they will likely get more power. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that if even if SOPA or Protect IP or one of those doesn't make it through, they'll eventually force something through, and it'll, it will take consequences. It will take uh, some injustices being served uh, for people to be able to go to Congress and say, "Look, this isn't working. You're giving too much power to one particular industry." But what gets me is that they're out there fooling people and lying to people saying our industry is in trouble when their industry is not in trouble. They, they make it sound like the industry is about to go out of business, that it's folding up, and it's not about to fold up. And we and do have industries that are. The newspaper industry actually is in very deep trouble, and that's, that issue is worth a lot more protection. But they don't get any of the protection, uh, except maybe in some side benefits, that the movie and TV industry is after. And we have malware like crazy. Facebook got turned into a porn site for a bunch of people. Do we give powers to uh, non-government authorities and to increase the powers of government authorities to to fight malware? No, we're prioritizing protecting an industry that's doing well over the safety of our own computers. And that just pisses me off.
Well, okay, and that yeah. brings me to my second my second question here, and I'm going to open this up to Scott as well. Up until now, there's been a very significant gulf between uh, homegrown content that's lived for free on the web, ad revenue supported, and uh, the, uh, quote unquote the good stuff. That's it, that you have talent and and uh, you know directors and high profile actors and so on. But with the with the hundred million dollars that Google's getting ready to spend on the whole YouTube initiative to bring in high quality talent do you feel like this is going to have have an effect is is this in any way related to the to, to cutting away cutting the knees out on from underneath uh this push for anti-piracy legislation uh yeah. go, go ahead tom no, go ahead scott I, well my do you let me ask you this because this a, this a bit of this feels like this is a terrible scenario but let's say you're you're a police chief in a town a small town and you're like damn it we've got to reduce crime and we've got to do it fast. All right, well, they hire new guys and they work really hard. And, and that, at the end of the year, you find out crime's down 50%. And then the mayor gets up and goes, yeah, but we really think we could have done 75% less crime. So uh, that's how this feels to me. It, it freaking take your wins, Viacom. Okay, that's the first thing. Second of all, because it just irritates the hell out of me. Second of all, um, it, if, if somebody like... Uh, I don't know who somebody makes a, a web series and the person usually comes from film and TV. He's part of the traditional Hollywood, you know, uh, system. And he's like, you know what? This is hot new stuff. I'm going to go, you know, you know, work on uh, my cool new web series and it's going to star so and so and it's going to be this amazing hit. It's going to be ad supported. We're going to sell it on iTunes and do DVD sales afterwards. Are, are you saying that 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 somehow this and these efforts by traditional media are trying to and correct me if I'm wrong, are trying to, it, their efforts are to undercut the ability for people to innovate online? Brian, is uh, that what no, you're... No, no, no. I, my, my question is, uh, w w there, there seems to be a clear movement online for the way people want to consume their media that is incompatible with traditional media's uh, druthers on how they want to sell it to you, right? And then you have something like this YouTube initiative where they're getting high quality talent. Uh, it's all going to be ad supported. It's going to make YouTube the next big network and, and it's going to speak to this under 30 crowd and they're going to uh, flock in droves to it, I assume. All of a sudden, as you see this working within the system, does that undercut the argument for these big media oldsters coming in saying, no, we must stop piracy. When meanwhile, uh, the, this whole the, one of the side effects of this whole YouTube thing is that it's going to make it so it's like, why bother to stop piracy? Piracy is the free advertising that's getting people here to watch our ads so we continue to make money hand over fist. And the question right. is, is as the quality of, of internet grown content goes up, does that, does that, cut away the argument of people saying no there's only one way to stop that and that's to fight the piracy by putting an uh, an increasing number of fingers in an increasing number of cracks in this dike here well i just think it's really important for this to succeed so youtube's initiative and others if if they if we really want to see a change in traditional media or maybe just i don't know a turning of opinion so that executives at companies like viacom can actually look at the space and go oh wow there's real potential for us here we could do some things here instead of doing weird stuff like pulling out of hulu and then coming back and then arguing about who has what on youtube and making people do pull downs and and all that sort of thing maybe they'll stop for a second and go well wait our we have a lot of content we have a lot of great stuff our comedy central alone is full of great stuff what if we were smarter about the way we did web stuff instead of constantly digging our heels in? So the answer is if, if YouTube and others can, can kick up enough dirt about this and have real success online, finally maybe Viacom goes, well, okay, fine. They throw up their hands a little bit and they, and they, and they jump in the pool. I really hope well, that's what happens because I love their stuff. And that seems to be what happened with the music industry uh, from the very beginning. Was everybody was convinced that uh, that oh, you know, the sky's falling. People are trading MP3s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, and then one day, all of a sudden, years after the relevance is over with, they shrug their shoulders and say, eh, no DRM on iTunes. And uh, and that's how it happens. Is that you have a uh, you clearly see the success of the new model and then the old model looks just increasingly stupid until finally we decided not make it illegal to tie your burrow to a tree on Sundays or whatever <laughs> idiot arcane law. Which is still illegal in Petaluma. So next right. time <laughs> next time you're in town, Brian, with your burrow, remember that, okay? Exactly. Let's take a quick break and thank a sponsor of this episode, Ford and Ford Sync with my Ford Touch turning your car 
into a rolling hot spot. Now, when you're driving, you've got Ford Sync, so you don't need to be surfing the web. You can, you can talk to your car and make it play all kinds of music for you and give you the weather and everything. But the passengers in the car, they probably want to be looking at their streaming video. They want to be surfing the web, maybe answering some email, working on some Google Docs, and they can do that uh, with the Wi-Fi hotspot in Ford. What you do is you uh, plug in a portable wireless access card into a USB port located in the center armrest console, or if you have a BlackBerry, you can just tether it. Uh, you can connect the hotspot wirelessly via Bluetooth. Then you can connect up to five Wi-Fi-enabled devices to the hotspot using a secure password. It's like putting tires and a chassis and a drivetrain on one of those MiFi Wi-Fi hotspots. With that, that's too hard. And those yeah, things are too small it. to fit in. So <laughs> Ford did the smart thing. They said, let's actually make the car into right. the hotspot. I'm not, I'm not, I cannot 100% back this up, but I'm like 99% sure I saw a story that was about to break last year that Sprint was about to start adding cars to the MiFi hotspots. Pretty sure Ford heard about that and said, hey, wait a minute. That we doesn't make any sense. Really yeah. well. Yeah. Why don't we just add Wi-Fi to the cars? So I think that's sure. a lot easier. Ford had the right idea. Uh, so check it out. In a sync with my Ford Touch featuring Wi-Fi connectivity is available on the 2012 Ford F uh, Focus. Uh, and you can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. We thank them for their support of Frame Rate. Time for Film Foul. <laughs> So we spent way too much time ranting and raving on this show. We got to move through these things uh, rather briskly. So, so right, let's let do. Just, it. Let me just say, all I need to say about this next story is I think it's the worst idea ever. Go Criterion on. Collection films coming to iTunes, but without special features. Why is that the worst idea, Brian Brushwood? Uh, because Criterion Collection means exactly one thing to me. It means exceptional bonus features on every single one of their releases. They've done a great job. Of course, the quality of the content is very good. It, it means two things. It means special features, and it means the highest quality presentation of these classic films you're going to get. And the two things that you find out is, number one, no special features when you buy it on iTunes. Number two, you can only buy it in standard definition or rent it in high definition. So it's like uh, this is the worst of all worlds. This is the worst solution I've ever seen. Scott Johnson, 40 films available from $15 to $3.00. But without the special features you came to know and love on your Laserdisc versions of these Criterion Collection movies, how do you feel? It's pretty gimped. Yeah, I don't like it either for the same reasons that Brian said. I also think that, uh, I mean, Criterion was never much about director's cut style stuff. Some of it is, but not all of it is. Most of it's just, you know, remastered and that sort of thing. Without the special features, I'm actually less bummed about the standard def versus high def because I do a lot of this kind of stuff portably and it really doesn't matter that much to me. Um, I think that's still a big sticking point. But the main thing is no extra features. There is no point to this. This is dumb, dumb idea. Next film film story. Uh, Scott Johnson, do you watch Doctor Who? I do. I do. Or I should say I'm way early in the process because you, sir, finally talked me into watching Brian Brushwood, do you watch Doctor Who? Never heard of it. I hope it turns into something someday. Do either of you <laughs> care that David Yates, the guy that did a bunch of the Harry Potter movies, has been signed on to develop a reboot of Doctor Who as a film? I actually, okay. I actually do uh, like this idea, mainly because I was the one person in all of America who loved the made-for-TV Fox movie of Doctor Who. Back well, that was not a reboot. That was no. canon. That was in line. They actually had right. Sylvester McCoy. This would be ta starting over again outside the canon. Well, and keep in mind also, there was a bit of a reboot when they relaunched, and I know it's all canon or whatever when they started the new show. It was a uh, restart, as I have been told many times by many people in the chat room, not a reboot. <laughs> right, exactly. It is a restart. But it, it is a reboot in that it was a completely different shift in focus. It was a difference in tone. It was much more Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. And, uh, and, and as was pointed out in this article, they focused on the story of, of Rose Tyler and, and her swept into this other world. And rather than, you know, the, the Doctor was just this mysterious guy who had nutty adventures that we never, you know, that were only alluded to until eventually you found out more in the future. I say, look, man, uh, there's a reason that we love to have stories retold in new and innovative of ways and yes we're a little bit reboot crazy but i think if you're going to make doctor who palatable to the large scale audiences which i think we're this close from having oversaturation as it is uh, i i think it's probably is a good idea to to allow them the freedom to tell the story because really all you need to know and this was mentioned in the article is that he's in a police box he goes through time and is bigger on the inside than on the outside that's and it. that is the reason why they don't need to reboot 
the thing. They just need to make a movie that's in concession. This thing's been going for 40 years without needing a reboot, and they've showed time and time again that they can make it fresh by having the Doctor and the TARDIS going through the universe time traveling. They don't Correct. need to reboot it. It's a horrible idea. They have one thing going for it. That's David Yates. I think he's a really talented director. I love his take on the Harry Potter movies. He did four of them. They were fantastic. I think he has got the right tone for it. The problem is, and he's the one saying it, is they're going to start the thing over and need a fresh take on the property. That's a huge mistake because the fan base is going to eat you alive. There is no way that fans are going to be happy about that. And you need them to get the groundswell going so that a lot of people get into it. Also, the trailer better feature somebody going, exterminate, and if they don't, I'm not going. That, By the way, they should if they're smart, they'll reboot it the way J.J. Abrams rebooted Star Trek by making yes. it fit within the canon, which they could well, And do. there's no that reason they okay. could do that. And in yeah, fact, that's exactly. my prediction, especially after the success of, of Star Trek. You're right now. You've gone from being wrong to being right. Uh, <laughs> Bruce Campbell <laughs> says, Bruce Campbell says that Ash will not be in the Evil Dead remake. They are re remaking Evil Ooh. Dead, but without Ash. Ooh! <laughs> he is, Ash is Evil Dead. I cannot remember one thing in that whole series that does not involve Ash. He's the heart and soul. He's the defining characteristic. He, Ash is the reason I love the video game Orcs Must Die, because it reminds me of a cocky swagger who just gets swept up in this other world. It's it, Even though it has nothing to do with Evil Dead. Oh, my God. Ash, this is idiotic. Ash is Terrible. the reason that any true fans of Evil Dead would want to go see a remake. Yes. And but without yes. Ash, it's kind of like, well, then what's the point? But what if they not, just have, what if they have a character that's just like Ash, but they just call him something different like Bob? Then you're stupid. Then or, you're dumb and you're idiotic and you should not <laughs> even... You're probably running the Doctor Who reboot if you think that. <laughs> Look, I think that I think that there there are going to be people who don't care, and if it's a good movie, they'll see it anyway, and they don't yeah. have the kind of emotional well, connection we all yeah. do to Ash. I'm with you, Bushwood. I'm with you, buddy. I love Ash. You got to have Ash in your movie. I'm going to be a cranky old old man about it. But there's a whole generation of people no idea what we're talking about, and we'll probably be okay with it. I'm more pissed that there's not a Ash in it, and b that he's not playing Ash. I don't care if he's old. All the right. better. He doesn't age he's awesome let's use him again what, that's, that's what, and, that, and that's the other thing one more quick but quick thing before we move on it doesn't have to be group bruce campbell it has to be ash that's the only thing yeah i would love to see some youngsters take on ash that would be fantastic but then you know what's going to happen no uh, you know the character change reboot, the whole story reboot. change reboot. the whole narrative <laughs> the whole plot just put ash all right. Uh, all also want to met, mention there's an upcoming documentary showing the world's greatest Tetris players. Uh, there's a there's a bit of a trailer up on Ars Technica if you want to take a look at it. But this I, I this love the idea of this. Uh, coming and to it theaters. reminds me. I love the idea of this. It reminds me of the King of Kong. I it yeah. does. The preview did not look anywhere near as engaging as King of Kong. King of Kong was smart enough to really focus on the people playing the game, not on the game itself. This seems a little too focused on the game itself. Uh, of course, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know. But my enthusiasm is is lower. I'll probably watch it anyway. Let's check in on the winter movie draft. Uh, play, Let's check in on the winter play, movie draft right now. Play. Brian Brushwood sitting in the pole position, ranked number one, $174 million, followed by Justin Robert Young and $124 million. Jim Brian Brushwood, how does it feel to be in the top spot? Uh, let me tell you what, dude. I was feeling really bad about Puss in Boots, but now it is my money maker. That thing is a cash cow that keeps on going. It is now, in the entire game, the number one highest grossing one so far. And I'm sure I'll get stomped later, but for this brief moment, let me tell you. I, everywhere I go, I'm only seeing ads for the Muppets and for um, uh, Arthur Christmas, which makes me think that I suspect, my prediction is, is that Arthur Christmas is going to turn out to be my best buy of the entire game and may give me a shot at kissing number one till you crush me with your Twilight people. Your Arthur Sparks Christmas is probably going to do better than people expect, but not as well as maybe you just made it sound. But I think you're right. I think it's going to be a surprise hit. Uh, and I believe that I will be number one next week after Twilight comes out. <laughs> wow. Because... Wow. Happy Feet 2 is going to do all right, but it's, it's going to make some new Twilight money. level. Yeah. yeah. Scott wait, Johnson, wait, wait, we need to get you in on this next time. This week? Yeah, I have, yeah, I have not been uh, partaking. I haven't, I haven't been invited, but I will say that uh, <laughs> Puss, in Puss in Boots, big fat surprise for me. I thought people were so shreked out that even a spinoff would not do this kind of money, and it's crazy. That, well, it started that movie off, is a machine. It, it started off pretty crappy, and, and then it's, it's done well in its second and third weeks. It kind of pulled it back into respectability. Yep. Let's move on to Tube Tops. 
Android users get something first this time, and Netflix <laughs> has redone their user interface just in time for the new Kindle Fire. Uh, you're going to get this hot new Netflix interface, which gives you more choices on the main screen, and it's coming to Android. They said the iPad, the iPad one is coming soon. Don't worry. Coming. We'll get to you guys. In a, in a matter of weeks, right? Yeah, a matter yeah. of weeks. No, no, hold on. Tom, are you actually an Android kind of guy? Or are you just an Android sympathizer who uh, who wants to, to, to try on that hat of, of firstness for a change? Oh, no, I'm just a troublemaker. I actually, I, I, don't, I don't own any Android devices personally. My wife does. She's a huge Android fan. Well, I know because your wife, of course, uh, is a co-host of All About Android. I feel I feel like you're trying to score points with the misses right now by acting I'm like trying this. Trying to convince her to cut the cord, okay? Don't undermine. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, the Boxy Box gets live TV integration. Uh, at least that it showed up in an unreleased 1.5 update. So if we get, we had Avner on the show a while back, and he said that yeah, the updates uh, to the to the offline to the to the to the laptop version aren't going to come very fast but he should they should be having some good updates coming to the boxy box so this may be one of the things he was alluding to i don't know uh, but the ability to have live television over the air through your cable but tuned in through the boxy box something google tv already does it'd be a, it'd be a welcome addition don't you think Oh, absolutely. I think the enhanced television viewing experience is something that we've all heard about coming for a long time. I, I do think practically it's going to be you sitting in front of a television with an iPad in front of you. But in the meantime, if there, if people want to tinker with the idea, maybe, you know, have live tweets showing up while you're watching shows or whatever, I'm, I'm all for the experimentation. After a 13-year hiatus, Red Dwarf is definitely back for a full series with all the old familiar faces. Uh, first full series since 1999, Lister, Rimmer, Cat and Crichton uh, face six exciting new adventures from the pen of Doug Naylor. Not a reboot. It's just Yay. back. Yay. Uh, now, what, now, wait, are you excited, are you excited say, Scott? Oh, beyond excited. I watched the hell out of this show. I watched this. I mean, we used to get it on PBS a lot, and then we, you know, BBC America and other stuff had it. But I've watched this over and over, and I've seen it all, and I'm stoked. I mean, I can't believe they've got the entire original cast back. I don't know how people have aged, so we'll see, but totally excited for this. I think it'll be great. That was my big question. As you said, familiar faces. I didn't know if you meant familiar characters or familiar actors, but it sounds like it's the actual original cast, huh? Oh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Is it, Tom? Uh, I'm ch I'm double checking on that right now. Chat room's gonna have it for us in about two seconds anyway. But I'm gonna say like if it's been what since n how long ago did it go off the air? We're talking mid 90s. 99, 99, N 99, 10 years. 10 yeah. years not bad. I wouldn't mind seeing actors still uh, in the same roles. Steven but, 3X but, says it, it is, and and from the look of this picture, I think it is. Yeah. All right. Okay. No, it's great. Good on I'm you, in. man. I'm in. I wonder if it'll be. I wonder how the production value will go because you know there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about Doctor Who going from you know crappy sort of video uh, tech cameras that when they yes. started to what they do now, which looks great and digital and everything else and wide widescreen and all that. Red Dwarf suffers from a lot of the things that you know uh, British aging. comedy and British TV suffers from. Not HD. It was filmed for PAL. It kind of looked crappy. The video quality is a, you know, weird frame rates and all that. No, no pun intended. Um, and this is a weird frame rate, by the way. But but yeah. it'd be really nice to see if they could, uh, you know, bump that up some because that's the only complaint I ever had about the show. Wall Street Journal reporting that Sony could be the latest company to try taking on the cable industry. Uh, remember, we talked about Dish provide uh, looking uh, rumored to be looking to provide live television channels over the internet instead of over satellite. Apparently, Sony is doing the same thing. They're in talks with media companies about launching a TV-like service that would be delivered to its PlayStation 3 game console and other connected devices. Devices, so maybe like uh, PSP or Sony Ericsson phones. Sony has approached multiple media companies about the proposal, which would create a bundle of TV channels that would be streamed into consumers' homes. Now, is that cutting the cord? If something uh, like this eventually comes out and you switch to that? Yes, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Like Xbox yeah. being able to watch HBO Go on your Xbox 360. I mean, it's like what we want to do. Let's face it. I mean, what we want to do is cut out the jerk middlemen of cable. And and they're really not going to like it. But we really are fed up with their one-size-fits-all, you know, no a la carte services. you got to gobble the whole stupid burrito just to get the one thing you actually like in it. Cable satellite and IPTV providers are not going to allow this to happen, though. However, Sony has leverage because Sony has television channels and they can and say Sony pictures and you try to stuff, stop yeah. us we'll try to stop you 
They've got the whole Sony backlog. They've got the whole Columbia Pictures backlog. They have all the TV properties tied into that. It's actually a really good power play, and I think it could, you know, it could help. I just, we just all want good a la carte solutions. This is a step in that direction. That is part of cutting the cord. Absolutely. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor, uh, of course, because it's a cord-cutting show. Uh, Netflix would like you to try them out for free. Netflix.com slash twit. It is one of those things that you can get over the Internet and watch TV shows and movies in unlimited numbers streaming right to your, well, forget your desktop and laptop. Of course they do that, but to your tablet, to your television, over a PS3, over a Wii, over an Xbox 360. Get it for free for 30 days, or if you already have it, tell a friend. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank them for their support of frame rate. Now it's time for what we're watching. And uh, Brian, that always throws me off when all of a sudden I talk after I talk. <laughs> but I love that way that what looks. We're That's watching. Cool. <laughs> what we're watching. Brian, what are you watching? Uh, you know what? I'm, uh, this has been an exceptional week for me. I put a joke in the doc saying that I'm watching uh, Twit, 12 episodes of Scam School, NSFW Frame Rate. Uh, it's just been nothing but content creation as opposed, as opposed to content consumption. To be honest, I got home and I was so exhausted, I slept through my opportunity to watch The Walking Dead. But I got up early for you. Plop the kid in front of uh, Netflix so I can watch uh, so I can watch The Walking Dead, and I got things to say about that. If you we yeah, got let's, time. let's do a spoiler zone at the end. Scott, are you caught up on Walking Dead? I'm not. I'm way. I'm kind of behind, which is stupid because the whole first series or last season series, I I was always up to date, like day and date, and this time I'm like three episodes behind. So, but if you guys got to spoil, I will go la la la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we, 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 what we've been doing is after the end of the show, we add in a special spoiler zone so people who haven't seen can stop watching or listening to the show and not get spoiled. So we'll, if, we'll if, let you go then. Tell, you can tell me all about the part where, um, where Shane's earlobes disappear finally because I cannot stand those freaking earlobes. They're driving dude, me crazy. Dude, they're they're like everywhere. old lady swinging, swinging uh, hoop <laughs> earrings. <laughs> like like Justin Robert Young told me they have their own credits, those two guys, those two lobes. It's amazing. <laughs> but you're, okay, Scott, you're, you're cutting cords all right and left. You're running around the house with scissors just, you know, and, uh. and your wife's like, hey, that's the, uh, cor the uh, curling iron. Don't, okay, never mind. But what are you watching uh, now that you've cut the cord? Well, uh, we are watching Walking Dead, of course, but I'm a little bit behind. Uh, catching up on Breaking Bad. That's a bunch of it's on Netflix, so we're catching up on that. That's a show How I absolutely love. Yeah. And I just got behind is all. I absolutely love that show. And I've been avoiding spoilers all year, so I'm on season three. Everyone leave me alone. I'll get there. Uh, so that's happening. American Horror Story. We're getting real quick after uh, not day and date, but watching it usually a day or two after. That show is freaking nuts and awesome and crazy, and I can't believe it's on like regular cable blows my mind that that show exists. Um, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's amazing. And uh, oh, Beavis and Butthead, that's real good. But the thing I'm most excited about, uh, Hell on Wheels, man. It's a western. You know, it's I've got FX. that on the DVR, but I haven't started watching it. It's on AMC, uh, it's right? Right after Walking Dead. AMC, not FX. I said FX on AMC. It is. <laughs> fantastic it is a western it is red dead redemption the tv show it is you know i love westerns i talk about this all the time i am a huge western fan it is america's mythology we don't have anything like this in the states other than this kind of thing it was a 20-year period in history that we have made last forever and it's all in the desert and we've all got guns and horses and it's fantastic and this movie or this show knows it and i'm all in i, I cannot wait for this to, to fish itself out it's a really Not really good show first passionate supporter of hell on wheels that i've encountered because I, I am very susceptible to bad reviews because I, I, I value my time very highly and if somebody craps on something I'm very likely to be like oh well maybe I'll watch it if it turns out to be good but uh, and the initial reviews seem pretty tepid for Hell on, uh, Hell on Wheels but you seem passionately for it. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. It's not, okay, if anyone goes into this thinking it's Deadwood, you'll be disappointed. It's not okay. Deadwood. Okay, that's, that's um, what I was hoping it, was, it would be, it was Deadwood. Yeah, I love if you want that, if that's your standard, it's, you're probably aiming a little bit too high. But if you want this rare thing in PV, which is a serialized Western that's on every week that you can watch with your own two eyeballs, if you're passionate about Westerns, you will let it be less than Deadwood and still like it. It's, I so, like so it a lot. It's more like a procedural where every week to week there's just some adventure and it's in the old Well, it's definitely, it's definitely not like Villain of the Week, for sure. It's definitely sort of got a, you know, a continuous plot and there's lots of carryover, for sure. It's basically following this, uh, at least so far, it's following this group of people that, that's all kinds of walks of life that are sort of moving with the railroad expansion. And right. it's, it's, it's awesome. It's dark and it's fun and it's got some cheese and it's got some just great cowboy moments. 
I'm totally in. I don't care. I don't care if it goes all downhill all year. I will watch every single episode of that thing. And if it does, I'll let you know. But, you know, it's, it's one if you're tepid. I don't know. Maybe hold off if you're not a huge Western fan. But if you like Westerns at all, this fits the bill. It's awesome. Yeah, I've been playing too many video games. Uh, so I, I, Top Chef, Texas, uh, Fringe, and Walking Dead are about the only things I've been watching. Um, Skyrim and NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month, have taken up a lot of my television watching time. So let's move yeah. on to Interferon. I wish we had more time to explain this one, but there's a great article at webmonkey.com, Wired does, uh, if you want to check out more about it. Mozilla is trying something called Popcorn. It's a JavaScript, uh, I guess it's a JavaScript library would be a good way of putting it, that uses HTML5 video features to their best effect, trying to show that video on the Internet shouldn't just be taking the flat video that we put on the television and streaming it to the Internet, because with HTML5, it can be so much more. Uh, so HTML5 can do things like tap into WebGL, uh, use JavaScript to augment video in real time, annotate videos with information like location, details about the people and topics in the video subtitles, Twitter feeds, current weather information. One example is a uh, movie called One Millionth Tower. It's a documentary film about an apartment building and how residents imagine the future. Uh, if if you haven't seen it, check out the Underwire blog uh, at Wired for more information. But it uses some of those popcorn tricks, uh, like the environment changes based on real-time weather conditions and the time of day at the Toronto high rise. So if you watch this when it's nighttime in Toronto, then it's going to be nighttime in the movie. If it's raining in Toronto, it's going to be raining uh, in the movie. So wow. really cool stuff going on uh, with popcorn that shows like, hey, wait a minute, when we deliver a video on the internet, we don't have to stick to just just delivering the video we can we have the opportunity to do all kinds of cool stuff that is yeah, phenomenal I mean, yeah and crowdsource this stuff you can do all sorts of things i mean that's one of the the beauties of this is that we can now have pop-up video for real from the crowd it doesn't have to be just what vh1 wants to say it can be i worked on this set and this thing over there is a goof you can see me standing with the production crew and this movie set in 1800 and how would that be or you can see this car way over here because i've you know whatever i i love this kind of thing i don't know how close this is to truly crowdsourced stuff but you see this on youtube now you see it in other places where you can annotate and create sort of an interactive experience it's the ultimate goal, I think, in special features almost. Um, all this interactive stuff we can do on DVDs and Blu-rays, why not do it in streaming video? I love and, it. And, you know, it can be misused, obviously, but that's like any tool. I, I, think, I think it's cool to say, like, hey, it's the Internet. Let's, let's take advantage of it. Let's not just stop at streaming stuff. And that, that goes back to this whole idea of, like, innovation. There's lots you can do to monetize. If we, all you're thinking about is copies of movies, you're going to get stuck in a loop. Look at popcorn. You can't pirate that. You can't pirate the ability to tap into something that tells you whether it's snowing in Toronto while you're watching the movie. That encourages well, you to watch it live. Right, that is the right answer. That's uh, Follow what's happening in the games industry. Games industry is, co of course, still rife with piracy, but there are certain types of titles that the experience itself is unpiratable. You can't pirate an MMO. You can't pirate online deathmatch play for you know for, on, on Modern Warfare 3 or what have you. Uh, that's the kind of way they should be thinking of, is give something exceptional that the, the essence of it can't be pirated. Let's uh, move on to a little behind-the-scenes film. Uh, Brian, I think you put this in the, in the lineup. Yeah, I, Sean I Young, huh? Yeah. I had mentioned this a while ago, but Sean Young, who has been in a bunch of movies, especially from the 80s, uh, she took video, behind-the-scenes video, of the making of Dune, and look at some of this stuff. Like this is the, the David the Lynch wow. Dune, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One he took his name off of, but he directed it. Uh, here, I'm showing it, some of it over. You can cut it over to here, Jason. But it's like you can see the behind the scenes there's of their Sting sitting there having dinner with the, the, the folks. You see Patrick Stewart there. There's Kyle you McLaughlin. Kyle McLaughlin. Uh, this, this amazing talent, and it's such a love letter to that time and the optimism. This, this all took place before they knew what a commercial failure the Dune movie would be. And it's obvious from her narration that she is deeply associated with this and has very passionate feelings about it. Um, it's got virtually no views. It's only got like 74,000 views. But uh, definitely 
look it up. Just type in Sean Young Dune, and it's the first thing that shows up. It's all on her personal channel. Uh, you know, you see Max von Sydow. You see the behind-the-scenes stuff. You see um, just so much joy because at the time, it was one of the most expensive science fiction epics ever put out there. So people, regardless of knowing how it was going to turn out, there was a lot of love going into this, and you could really feel it on there. I, I recommend checking that out. Now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do need to mention real quick that that find comes courtesy of uh, Casey McKinnon, who we oh, should thanks, yeah, yeah, Casey's a huge Dune fan. She's amazing. And we should definitely book her onto Frame Rate for sure. First item of feedback comes from Davey via electronic mail. He writes, Hey, Brian, <laughs> Tom. I was just watching Castle, a guilty pleasure of mine. I have been a fan of Nathan Fillion for years. And aside from its weird murder she wrote meets law and order vibe, it's a pretty geeky show. It really hooked me at Halloween last year when Nathan showed up in his Captain Malcolm Reynolds outfit. In the show, someone asked him what he's supposed to be. He tells them, a cowboy, a cowboy from space. And the response is, didn't you wear that like five years ago? <laughs> Anyhow, I wanted to share that and ask you guys what your guilty pleasures are. Love the show. So my guilty pleasure, I didn't know it was a guilty pleasure until I mentioned it on frame rate a while ago. I am I am deeply in love with how it's made. It is the most zen, gorgeous, like giving you answers to questions you didn't even know you had. I could sit there and zone out to it for hours and hours and hours, and I have been now that it's on Netflix. Uh, but, but when I brought it up, everyone was just like, snore fast. I don't care how aluminum foil is made, old man. Listen, what about you? old man. She's fast enough for you. Uh, Scott Johnson, every time anyone says old man, that's, that's what pops in my head. Scott Johnson, uh, guilty pleasure, do you want to share with us? Do you have something? I, I got one, uh, so I can go I, if you don't. I do have one, um, and I'm always embarrassed to admit it, and it almost seems like the hipster thing to say when you're talking about crap TV that you shouldn't like, but I really, really get into Jersey Shore, and I know it's bad. <laughs> I know it's terrible. I know it's bad in every way and that none of us should be watching it and that it's complete crap and the worst postcard America sends to the rest of the world. I know that, but I still really like it, and I watch it every week. That is a fun train wreck to watch. I don't even feel like it's real. It's just a big cartoon, and I... They have me every season. I watch that stupid, well, the chat stupid, room is terrible not show. Not being kind to you. I know. I told you, hey, dude, guilty pleasure. Whatever, man. They're willing to admit that they're into it as well. <laughs> Look at the booze. Jeez. <laughs> no, they're 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 rough on you, man. Uh, all right. What about you, Tom? I, I just I, my whole perception <laughs> of Scott Johnson has changed. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I don't even know. Actually, it makes me feel a lot better about my my guilty pleasure. <laughs> which right now, uh, my guilty pleasure is uh, Pan Am. Uh, oh my gosh, oh. you really you've come around. You were you were sort of like, oh, I guess I don't know. I guess Pan well, Am. And that's why I call it a guilty pleasure because uh, here here was the conversation last night. Okay, we haven't watched Pan Am in two weeks. Eileen's sitting down. She's like, I think I'm going to watch Pan Am. Is that okay if I watch it without you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm busy. You know, I'm playing some video games, stuff. You know, go ahead. Just watch it. I I'm going to give up on Pan Am. This was last night, mind you. Okay, so I'm playing. I finish up stuff in the video game. I think, oh, this is about where I need to stop. And I realize she hasn't started watching it yet. So I, I kind of, not run, but I move in rather quickly. So I get in there and, and I sit down. She's like, you're going to watch it with me? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll just read my book while it's on. Totally watch the whole thing. Like, it's just... It's just gorgeous, and it's silly. Just, and the, like, there's just switch your brain off. And you, you could love fly one of those things. Pan Am jets through the plot holes in this thing, uh, <laughs> but it is it is still you know it's and it's not Mad Men. It's not that deep, uh, but but it's I don't know. It's just it, it's the definition of a guilty pleasure in that like I have no defense for liking watching it, but I have. And then when she wanted to watch the second one, I was like, well, I'm kind of tired. Can can is there anything else you can watch so I don't miss it? But, yeah, there you go, Pan Am. Uh, we got one more email, and I think this will lead in nicely to our uh, spoiler zone after the show. Hi, Brian, Tom Guest. I disagree with Brian about The Walking Dead. I'm still enjoying the show. I'm concerned uh, by Robert Kirkman, who, quote, uh, who I quote, quote, I work on the TV show. I'm in the writer's room, and it's fun for me to look at it as a do-over. I can fiddle with things. I can play George Lucas. <gasps> and I can oh. think... 
well, what would happen if Shane had lived? How would that change things? Um, and then there's a lot of other stuff as well. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in the spoiler zone, but I thought that was an interesting from the creator. Uh, and, and for the record, I am pro the creators changing their own works uh, as far as like uh, trying out different plot ideas. And and to some extent, I'm even, I'm even okay with George Lucas's the idea of him tinkering with his own work in that it's an experiment and you find out what works and what way does not work. But, but for example, on Dune, to take it back to the Sean Young video that we saw, I love the idea that Frank Herbert, the creator of Dune, was the one to say, I don't know, let's try these weirding modules that take sound and make them into energy. That, that sounds kind of cool. I love that. I think it's great. And, and I'm okay with, on principle, what Robert Kirkman is doing. Now, whether or not this is a successful experiment or not, we will discuss in the spoiler zone. Uh, yeah, and there was there was, the thing about Shane that you just heard from that email is not a spoiler for the television show. It is in no, fact a spoiler, a spoiler for the anyway. comic book. Uh, but yes, not a, not not related to what's going on in the television show, at least as of this point. Plus, he's bringing up he's saying George Lucas in a in a way that he knows he knows the implications. He understands. Sure. It's not like he's going. I really enjoy how George Lucas has completely. You just up don't Star do Wars. that, though. If you, if no. you, ca I mean, if you care what the fans are going to say, you don't do that. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't care. But that's right. not a good example. I for agree. Most, for most people to identify with, it's missing context. I think he's joking there. Yeah, I maybe. really do. I think yeah. he's being sarcastic, Probably. and people are going to miss that. It's still bad. So. It's bad PR to say it either way. All no, right. It does tie into something, a point I had made earlier, and we talked about this in a previous spoiler zone, is in many ways, I feel like uh, all of the Walking Dead television experience is sort of a Marvel Comics issue of what if. And, and I feel like, again, the, in the chaos theory kind of way, I feel like it's just going to veer farther and farther off from the comic book as a result of implications of, for the small change they made early on. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. If you want to hear some spoilery talk about Walking Dead, stick around after the end of the theme music, and you will hear it. If you don't want to be spoiled, as soon as you hear that theme music, you might want to turn the whole show off. Show at gmail.com is our email address. Scott Johnson, thank you so much for sharing your cord-cutting stories with us. Let folks know about what's going on with you and where you can find it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. It was a blast being on. If they would like to know more about what I'm doing, in fact, uh, here's what I'll pimp. Go to filmsack.com. We have a podcast on the Frog Pants Network that takes Perfect. apart weird movies and weird corners of Netflix, and we do it every, each and every week, all four of us. It's a total blast. I think they'll like it. Filmsack.com for more info. I really, really enjoyed the time I guessed it on Filmsack. Oh, wait. I've never been invited. <laughs> yeah, you didn't invite, we didn't invite him to the movie draft, so that's fair. Mm. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. We're even. Oh, yeah. we, can Touché. Make, we, Touché. we can make this all up later. <laughs> For now, we'll see you next time on Frame Rate. Bye, everybody. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? And and uh, so, so first of all, uh, there was plenty to follow. I'm engaged. Daryl is far and away the best contribution to the Walking Dead universe that the television show brings. He is the most interesting in that there are things that you want to hate about him, but there's things that, that are engaging and compelling as well. And this whole uh, this whole nature of him wrestling with himself, with his racist douchebag older brother, uh, and of course, Michael Rooker just killed it. And uh, if you have not read the comic books, I do not see how... You could remotely see uh, the the whole bard as a menacing, looming thing in that they've, they've barely acknowledged it. From the moment of introduction to the barn being a plot point to the resolution of figuring out what's inside of it, you're talking three whole minutes. And for you to act like that's like like no, oh wait like, didn't they didn't they in the, when they first got to the farm didn't Herschel say don't let him in the barn. I thought that was I'm, introduced already. Okay, yeah, okay, Tony's but, Tony's but, affirming that. And as it, soon as they said that. I was like, oh, yeah, well, this is going to be obvious because anybody who appreciates the zombie oeuvre knows that one of the common plot points everything turns on is I'm against all the zombies except for my former family members. And, okay, you know, Herschel's got this huge farm with a huge family, and he's going to have family members, and he's going to be keeping them in the barn. Okay, uh, first of all, no, I did not see that any of that coming. And I'm, and I'm reasonably familiar with, with the zombie motif uh, and in are, you, are you in, are you a non Romeroian? Uh, uh, well, I don't make up hurtful words to you know hurt your feelings. Uh, <laughs> look, here's the thing. I actually thought this was one of the better episodes. I cared about people for a change. I cared about Daryl. I actually, for the first time, kind of cared about finding the damn girl. I cared about uh, I cared about the relationship and how stuff worked out. For the first time, I saw something that resembled chemistry between Dale and uh, and what's her name, a sharpshooter. What's oh yeah, the, the barest, barest level yes, of it. Yes, but for the first time, I didn't want to choke the bitch. I mean, it was awesome. I I love it. I'm sorry, that's that sounded misogynistic and terrible. But like, I it has driven me nuts how unlikable they've made her this entire this entire season up until this point. This is the one time. This is the first episode where I felt like stuff was coming together and I was actually engaged. I can't believe you hated it. I what? No, let's let's not be let's be clear. Uh, I I probably made it sound a little hateful when I described it, but I was disappointed. I didn't hate it. I actually enjoyed the episode because I loved the stuff about Merle. Uh, and I, I love the line where you had Dale say, yeah, we've all wanted to shoot Daryl. I thought that was a great line. Uh, and it was a great way to end on Finding the Zombies. But I was just disappointed. I was like, ah. And I think I really all turns on that point where they shot Daryl and I got so excited. And I was like, this is it. This is no Walking way. Dead. Because I don't want Daryl to die. I desperately don't. I just got to love him so much. And that's what the comic book was all about. That was the genius of Kirkman, was you get to love a character or a situation, and then he just rips it away from you and throws you off into the fire. And I thought that's what was finally happening, but instead it was like, oh, no, he's fine. And everything's still at the house. And there's some bubbling tension. And we still haven't found Sophie. And... And she still thinks she's pregnant. And she still hasn't told anybody. And those two are still... It was just like, there was just wasn't any progress. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to get massive spoilery here, where it's like, uh, you, that's an interesting choice of words. She still thinks she's pregnant. Because she is pregnant in the comic books. Well, yeah, I know. I, and I only said that because... I wasn't thinking. What, very, you didn't want to spoil no, anything? I just, no, just, the spoiler zone. <laughs> I just wasn't thinking very hard about what I was saying right at that time. <laughs> uh, okay, well, look, I'm going to say those that this tests can be wrong sometimes, this Brian. <laughs> I'm gonna say this, like, uh, like, like. Uh, first of all, the entire first season was 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 up here, right? And then uh, the last episode uh, went to about half. Yeah. Uh, then the first season it went back up a bit. And then it, I've been down here. I've been going lower each time. Uh, the last two episodes, there's a little bit of an uptick. This is probably one of the better episodes for this for this season. I'm gonna I, say I won't, I won't. the season is in trouble. The show might be in trouble, but but right now, finally, momentum in the right direction. Actually, having a good time. I won't disagree with that. This was one of the better episodes of the season, but that just shows how bad the other episodes of the season have been. <laughs> how could you be disappointed? With this episode, though, it, surpri it, it surpassed all of my expectations. It did right. not surpass mine. Hey, by the way, I feel like now that Community is in danger of getting canceled before it's well, time. Apparently, when it's on hiatus, which is always one of the best yeah, shows out there. I feel like time. you and I should dive into Community. I've, I've watched probably, probably on, on total, I've watched close to a dozen episodes. I mean, I, I've seen about a half dozen, and I've enjoyed all of them, but yeah. but. 
but I've not been infected to that fever pitch level that everyone else is. And just knowing it's about to be uh, canceled, weirdly, makes me think it's probably no, even better. No, no, you know what we need to do? We need to wait until, like, next March uh, after, like, all of them have run and it's totally dead and there's no hope. And then we start watching them and, tell, and start a movement online about how awesome it is. <laughs> yes, and then while we're at it, we'll... Uh, We'll call it the Great Community Experiment. And we'll, and then we'll, we'll turn it into a cult party. hit. We'll go around trying to explain to people how good community <laughs> is and how we really, really should And how, if only we had discovered it sooner, we could have saved it. <laughs>